So step one is break down in a coffee shop <laughs> in public. <laughs> Every good thing that's happened in my life began with, it sounds like a disaster, which maybe that's just, you know. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Hey there, sunshine. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a fab game show to win big. As designers, we pitch good vibes and great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher-ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your mad skills by assembling a brand-inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you'll be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives, where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in the perfect match. Submit an entry and Adobe will buy you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with interior designer, writer, and TV personality, Kimberly Selden. Based in Los Angeles and Toronto, she founded Kimberly Selden Design Group in 1991. Kimberly is also founder of Business of Design, an online learning platform for independent designers, as well as a recurring on-air design expert for CityLine, previously host of the HGTV series, Design for Living with Kimberly Selden. And as you may well be aware, a new trend emerged in 2020 amidst the pandemic, RV travel. Hashtag van life on Instagram passed 7 million in 2020, and it's continued to rise over 10 million in 2021. What's more, an October 2020 survey reported that total RV shipments had increased over 20% year over year. And we're going to talk with Kimberly about her new interest in designing for hashtag van life. I mean, I'd really like one myself. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Kimberly Selden. Okay, kids, all the way from Los Angeles, California, please welcome Kimberly Selden. Kimberly, welcome to Obsessed Show. Josh, thank you so much for having me. I think we're out of time though. My intro was a little long, so we'll probably need to wrap it up. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. So uh, <laughs> tell them what they've won. Okay, so I'm on, honestly a little geeked out about the whole hashtag van life thing. And uh, had an opportunity to to rent a van last spring, which was really cool for a little trip out in Arizona. Um, we'll get to that later. But first, I always love digging into origin stories. So maybe we can talk a little bit about how you found your way into the world of design and kind of what got you to where you are today. It's so funny that you would even ask that. You know, I know some people grow up thinking they're talented and they just have a knack, but I, it was the opposite for me. When I was about 10 years old, shag carpet was really big. And <laughs> my mother, I don't even know what would possess a grown woman to allow a 10 year old to pick the carpet for the house, <laughs> but she gave me complete and total control over this decision. And I picked a different color for every room. And we're talking like blue in the living room, green in my brother's bedroom, orange in my bed. It was so hideous. I mean, I was like 10. Even I knew this was an utter disaster. And my parents lived with it for like 20 years. So yeah, my origin story is everybody when I went to design school said, what? You? <laughs> I think my parents might have hired you as a, as a little girl to do their carpet and their first <laughs> tri-level too, because we had the green and the burnt orange and then the playroom strangely had like almost black shag carpet, which meant every time we dropped the little gun that went to a star Wars toy, like it was just gone forever. <laughs> it was impossible to find it. Right. Yeah. Never. So the moral of the story is don't let 10 year olds decorate. Um, but you know what? I, I guess I went to school 
Uh, I thought it would be fun to go shopping with other people's money. That's literally what I thought when I entered design school. I already had a television, uh, a career in television. I worked at ABC in LA and then I ended up moving to Toronto and I thought, well, TV's kind of crazy. I'm going to study something else. And I chose design and I thought, gosh, it would be really fun to decorate other people's houses. They give me money and I just go out and go shopping. Uh, it turns out it's a lot more complicated. And I actually did learn the skill of decorating and the principles behind decorating. So that's my origin story. It didn't start well. <laughs> I think for those of us, you know, we've interviewed a ton of folks from the the creative agency world and and it's similar, right? Like we get a budget and we get to decide how to help clients spend their money. And, and it turns out it's way easier to spend other people's money than it is to spend your own when it's time to Indeed do those kind of things, is. but lots of fun spending other people's money. Yes. Um, so how did you find yourself in the HGTV world? I mean, I'm sure this, this could probably be its own entire conversation around this, but like, did you pitch a show? Did someone discover you? Like, how does one go about getting their, their own show on HGTV? Oh my goodness. Nobody will copy my example. It's like the most crazy story in the whole world. So I, uh, as I said, I had a TV career, uh, and I worked on a couple of movies and I moved to Toronto and I actually had a, a one job on a, at a TV station in Toronto as well as a producer. And then I decided to go to design school, which I did. And I had um, young children. So I had my babies and I worked in the evenings and I worked on weekends and I was a stay at home mom. But fast forward six years, I put my daughter, um, I, I had my son and now my daughter is going to school full time. So I dropped her off for her first day of full-time junior kindergarten. I walked around the corner from her school and I went into a coffee shop and ordered a coffee and sat at a table and burst into tears because I thought I have no, now I have no life. My career is terrible. I'm, I don't, you know, know what I'm doing yet. And I was a mom, but now my kids don't need me. They're at school all day. I like literally burst into tears in a public setting. And this woman came up to me who had worked on a TV show with me in Toronto and said, are you, Hey, hi, how are you? Oh my God. Are you okay? <laughs> and I told her everything and she goes, that's so weird. I just got hired to do a decorating show for this new network called HGTV. And we're looking for people. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and I think she means to be a producer, but she's like, yeah. no, you'd be great on camera. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, pathetic, really. And so I went in for an interview and um, I only had one tape. I only had one on camera uh, tape and uh, I just landed a job, which was crazy. It was a live, my first show was a live television show phone in. And uh, oh, interesting. Every day of the week was a different topic. So Monday was like psychiatry and Tuesday was like food and Wednesday was decorating and Thursday was dogs or, you know, veterinarian. So, and it was live, no delay at all. So I'm on Wednesday and somebody would call and say, my chihuahua has a uh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh no, that's, that's Thursday. I, I can tell you what <laughs> fabric to pick to live with a chihuahua. Anyway, it was really good training. And, uh, and then it all just went from there. I got so lucky. I got Hired to do a, a, a shopping special, uh, shopping the Paris flea markets for HGTV. And mm. then I got my own series. So I just, I lucked into it, which is not what people want to hear. People want to hear like you pitch and you just pursue it. Like I have no idea how to do that. So step one is break down in a coffee shop <laughs> in public. <laughs> Every good thing that's happened in my life began with, it sounds like a disaster, which maybe that's just, you know, maybe that's the Winnie, Poo, Winnie the Pooh philosophy. You just go where the wind blows you. <laughs> I think that's going to be the intro to the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so we've had these weird themes lately on Obsessed Show. I had, um, I had two lead singers on in a row, which is really bananas. And then uh, our last interview was with the founders of Blue Dot, the furniture brand. And so we have, you know, interior designer after that. So we've got kind of this interior thing happening right now. We were talking to them about, um, you know, new trends around COVID. And so I'm curious what you're seeing on the interior side. I know there was sort of a lot of COVID nesting going on, but 
But what have you seen over the past uh, 18 months or so? Well, interestingly, when when it first started, I thought, oh, wow, here we go. Because the creatives usually get hit pretty hard when there's an economic downturn. Anyway, I thought, this is it. I'm going to be out of work. We'll never have work again. But the opposite happened. People were at home and suddenly they're like, you know, we were going to do the kitchen in a couple of years, but we should just do it now. And so I, it started off as like a slow royal and it turned into a like explosion of work uh, to the point that like we're having to tell clients like we can't even think about starting anything new until the end of 2022 like we're swamped mm. until 2023 um so that was interesting now the big thing of course is product delays like if we if you want an umbrella for somebody's backyard you need to order it now and you'll have it um, if you're lucky, you'll have it for the summer of 2022, but you probably won't. You probably have it for the summer of 2023. It's that bad. Wow. So I would say, I don't, I don't, you know, let's hope it's not a trend that lasts very long, but um, certainly lead times are exaggerated and prices are going through the roof, not just with our trades, but also with our suppliers, everything. By the time we make a selection of a product. We say to a client, we, this is the chair we want you to have. The client says, yes, when we go back to order the chair a week and a half later, it's you know uh, 30% more expensive than when we proposed it to the client. So it's, yeah. it's kind of the wild west again. I wonder if that's driving more demand for custom, like one-off or bespoke pieces when they're like, well, you can't get it for 18 months. I can't order this so far. It's not in stock. And so... But even our custom suppliers, our, their lead times are just as bad. Oh, really? And what we're just saying to clients is now we'll order it now and we'll see you next year. And that's just how it's just going to be the new reality for a little while. It'll it'll yeah. eventually settle down. Um, but if you're a creative, at least in the interior design industry, you should be busy for the next couple of years anyway. Yeah, for sure. Well, I know that um, I read a little bit up on what you were up to uh, and you were kind of focusing on some themes of escape, travel, fitness, and sanity. Um, <laughs> are those all specifically to, uh, to COVID or are those things that were, that were big on your list beforehand? Well, I think all oh, the first three were big on my list beforehand, but sanity, I think is the one that got introduced during COVID. And you just, you know, like a lot of people, I just realized like, I got my priorities a little mixed up here. I'm working a little bit more. I need to put a little bit more fun and a little bit more escape into the equation. And nobody dies in my world if the project takes nine months instead of six months. That This mm -hmm. is not an emergency. So um, I think... I'm like, I'm happy that the sanity got added. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we talked a little bit in the intro about your introduction to, to van life. I'm curious what, uh, what inspired that? Was it client driven or something that you came up with or something you've always wanted to do? No, well, it definitely ticks a lot of those bu buckets, right? Travel, escape, and sanity. So it turns out my very best friend who lives in Laguna Beach, in March of 2020, we were supposed to go to Bali to a yoga retreat. And of course, that's just like, we were like on the fence, March 13th, still thinking maybe we could go. Yeah. And everybody else is like, are you kidding? Have you even looked at the news? And we're like, yeah, but what are the chances? Anyway, we didn't go. And in her wisdom, she's smarter than me by a lot. She decided I am going to grab a van, a sprinter van, and I'm going to deck it out. And so she called me and said, I'm out of van and I need some help and let's do this. And luckily she was really handy and uh, she ended up doing a lot of the work herself with her boyfriend who's in construction. So that was handy, but I got to consult in terms of the design and then I got to try it out, which was really fun to be able to go on, on the road and say, okay, this works, this doesn't. Like things like um, you have to have a, a catch on the drawers. Like, fine, we have a drawer for your t-shirts, but if you don't have a, a latch on it, every time you stop at a stop sign, the drawer flies open and the t-shirts yeah. fly out. Or every so, time you turn left, all the drawers on the one side slide open. <laughs> Exactly. So it was really fun. It, like you have to draw on your expertise in terms of small spaces because there can be no unused space and everything has to do more than one thing. So that was cool. 
um, it really, it was satisfying in so many ways to know that in that small amount of space, you could have everything you need and take an epic road trip. So I've been able to go with her to, we did a road trip to the Grand Canyon, which was amazing. And then we did uh, another trip from Nashville to Los Angeles, uh, which was really cool. And um, now I have another client in Toronto who's doing an RV. So I'm, so now I'm starting on that, which is great. So do you expect as, as these come along that you'll like oversee the building? I know you mentioned that they kind of handled that themselves, but is that something you're interested in? Like, at any level <laughs> being part of how it gets implemented? Oh yeah. I love the execution. I love being involved in the process of building and um, just, yeah, I know I'm looking forward to doing the whole thing myself for sure. For sure. Do you think that's going to be sustained uh, in terms of demand? Like, do you think people will only want more of these custom vans or do you think this is going to be a kind of a quick trend? I, you know, it's so interesting. I don't know. I, so many people went out and bought them and so many of them are so ugly. Like, I mean, <laughs> you said you rented one. I was like, really? How did that go? Right. What was it like? Yeah, it was mostly stock. The one that I rented, it was like, uh, I think it was a Winnebago, uh, conversion. So it was like a, you know, professionally vanilla build. Um, so, you know, it was kind of meant for the road and meant for, mobile. And so somebody had thought through all the technical stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't especially Instagram worthy where sort of what I picture in a custom sprinter would be like kind of a beauty first thing. Yeah. Well, function first, for sure in a small space, or you're really in trouble, but beauty yeah. second, I would say for sure. So I think a lot of people who have them are going to want to renovate them and decorate them and yeah. make them just right. So hopefully it'll be a trend that continues for all the people who love van life. And you know, the movie, what was the movie? Nomadland. Oh, that, yeah. couldn't, that didn't hurt. I wouldn't mm -hmm. think that would have hurt. Um, so I, you know, it's fun. Like, and you know, we're so blessed in both the United States and Canada, we have beautiful national parks, just spectacular national parks. So the idea that people would actually get out on the road and see them is pretty amazing. Yeah. And the thing that I loved about it, the one that we rented was like, um, you know, we could drive to a place and then stay there and then be up the next morning and be right there. So not have to like drive all over the place and then drive back to the hotel or just have one central place. So you can have a little bit more of a meandery trip where you don't have to just kind of be located in one central area. Yeah. It's, uh, it's I mean, I, I think it's, a. I mean, I love, don't get me wrong. I love to stay in a five-star hotel and have room service. Like that's fun, but it's just a different way to get out there and see the world and a just different pace. And I agree. Like just, we, we, uh, we spent a night in Joshua tree. Mm. So just to look up at the stars, you're falling asleep and you're looking at the stars. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, um, let's say that you're a moderately handy podcast host. <laughs> hypothetically speaking, hypothetically <laughs> speaking strictly <laughs> hypothetical. Um, whose greatest experience is building out a chicken coop. Um, so you know, is this something that most people would be able to put their hands to? Like if you helped with the design, is this something that most people could get done? Or is this like, you need to understand how to work with metal and how to saw through your van walls? And yeah. <laughs> like, where, where is this on a scale of one to 10 in complexity? I would say it's a good solid eight. Mm. And you also need a, 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 an electrician who knows what they're doing, who works with either uh, yachts, boats, or vans because it's very specific. And if you don't get that right, you're going to always have trouble on the road. I mean, you, you're dealing with, in, you know, a little water tank, a generator, solar power. It's really complicated. Um, I couldn't myself trick out a van without hiring professionals. And I mm. feel like I know a lot about design. I couldn't do it. I, I would never have the nerve to take a saw and cut through the side of my van to put a window in. Like, you no know way. Uh-uh. Yeah. The, the measure once cut twice plan doesn't work. Right. <laughs> You're sawing through an automobile. <laughs> like, oh, let's just get another roof. Uh, <laughs> 
that sounds super stressful, but, uh, but I love the idea of it. I think, I think it'd be super cool. Um, well, tell us about your team, you know, is it, is it a solo thing? We've, we've talked to folks on the show who like are I'm solo and I'm going to be solo forever or have hundreds of employees around the world. And, and where does, how does your uh, current team size out? We are, uh, we are about seven in total. And, uh, seven years ago we had an office building and that was largely unused. Uh, we're always on job sites. We're with clients. Mm. And so over and over again, I would come to the office and nobody's there. And I'm like, what am I doing with a big office? So we were, um, I'm so grateful we decided to sell the building and go remote before COVID happened. Because when Mm. COVID happened, we were we're ready to go. Yeah. So we get together for team meetings uh, when we can. Sometimes it's virtual. Uh, We do projects in uh, Toronto and LA, mostly Toronto. Most of our clients are in Toronto because that's where my more of my television work is. And so the phone's ringing there a lot, which is great. And we love to do the full build when we get a chance to. We love when the clients bring us a, you know, a plot of land and say, let's build a house. That's amazing. Um, and second to that, like a gut reno, like where we really tear the house apart. It's just, mm-hmm. we live for that stuff. Not to say we don't have clients who are just decorating because sometimes we do. Um, and the variety is nice. You know, it's just never boring. What is it about Toronto that draws YouTubers? <laughs> this is a total left field question and you may not have an answer to it, but especially since you worked in television, I'm just curious. Um, there's so many guys that are in the photo and video and film world doing YouTube. And it seems like everybody I follow who's any good at it is in Toronto. I'm just curious if you have any insights to that. That is so interesting. Well, there's a huge media um, television movie market in Toronto and a lot of comedians. Um, you, you know, the other thing, I don't I don't even know if this has anything to do with it, but they you know what the third largest city in Canada is. Toronto. <laughs> Los Angeles. So many people (laughs) from music, comedy, television, movies end up living in Los Angeles who are Canadian. My daughter lives in uh, Los Angeles. In fact, she's in the music industry and they have a huge group of friends who are Canadians and they get together and have Canadian Thanksgiving parties and, you know, maple syrup parties and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, So I don't know what it is. I guess it's just, it's an urban, it's a densely populated urban setting like LA or New York. And so you're going to get that just creative uh, group. And, you know, um, HGTV also has so many shows that are located in Canada. Part of the reason for that is because the producers of the shows get a big grant for using Canadian talent and, you know, filming in, in Toronto. So that's why a lot of movies, a lot of television shows, even if they're not filmed in Toronto or in Canada, they'll just randomly mention a place in Canada. Like watch it now. You'll see, you'll be watching some detective show that's set in who knows where Idaho and suddenly you go, we should go to Montreal and have a meeting with so-and-so it's like, Oh, I wonder how much money they got for saying that. Um, yeah. Probably doesn't well, answer your question. Well, it, it at least <laughs> creates some new, uh, some new theories. So that's helpful. Yeah. Um, so we've talked to enough creative pros on here to understand that nobody really has a typical day, but I'm, I'm curious, especially outside of like, you know, these fun van projects and whatnot, like what, what is a typical project for you guys? And, uh, and what, what are the kinds of things that you work on in a given week? So our office runs a pretty linear project management system. We have a 15-step project management strategy that we uh, use for every single client project. I'm heavily involved in steps one to five. And then from steps six to 10, it's really project management team that kind of takes over our senior designers. And then I'm more heavily involved at the end. So my morning would start early. I do a lot of the sourcing for clients. I'll go and pick the tiles, the fabric, the furniture. Um, I'll do the the drawing, the sketching, 
I'll do a rough sketch of how I want the room laid out and then somebody else will do the drawing. And the good thing about that is that I always, you know, I know what's my job and what's not my job. And I can sort of schedule the tasks I need to happen where I know what you're talking about. You mentioned that some people work for themselves. It would be so hard if I had to do every single job myself because you'd never, you'd never be off. There would never be a moment where you felt like you probably could do nothing for the day because there's always something that has to be done. Um, so I would say a good majority of my time would be spent making selections on behalf of clients and doing drawings on behalf of clients. Very cool. Any, um, you know, we, we kind of teased this out before the top of the show and we didn't really land the plane on anything, but are there any particular projects that you're excited about right now or any, any recent stories you'd like to share? Oh, I have, I have so many good projects right now, but you know, something really weird that happened. Um, we had, we had, we had one client and then we had two clients who did this exact same thing, which has never happened to me in 25 plus years of being a designer. We were all ready to go on a huge renovation at this one client's house. Uh, it's let's back it up. It's September, late September, the renovations beginning in November, everything is ordered, all the furniture, all the tile, all the toilets, all the sinks, all the plumbing, everything is ordered. It's in warehouses, ready to go. So late September, my client calls me and she says, you're not going to believe what we did. Tell me, she says, mm -hmm. we bought a new house. <laughs> I'm like, you did what? <laughs> Do what? Now, this is a house we ordered windows and doors for like custom windows and doors. Wow. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is awesome. Like, oh my God. Oh my God. So she says, we want to keep the exact same schedule. We just want to move everything we bought for this house to the new house. So that sounds easy, right? Like, oh my God. I'm sure God. the windows are all the same size. And <laughs> right? Right? So actually on Friday, the window company is going over to the new house to remeasure. And I'm like, you're getting some new windows and doors because you've already given them a huge deposit. They're not going to eat it. So they're willing yeah. to adjust some sizes for us, which was really nice. Um, that was a huge big deal. So then I'm meeting with this other client and we're talking about adding a, a big chunk to the side of the house, three stories, but a big piece. <laughs> I tell him about the client who bought a new house and he laughs. I swear to God, like two weeks later, he's like, you are not going to believe what we did. I'm like, what? <laughs> we bought a new house. I'm like, what is wrong with people? Like, I thought things are so crazy expensive right now. Who could afford to do that? Like, who I've could afford to do that? the housing market like, was crazy, but I had no idea that was this flavor of crazy. <laughs> Right. So I, I consider myself to be a pretty organized person who knows, you know, what's ahead of me every single day. Those it's just thrown my life into chaos. These two things. And the clients are like, it's not a problem. Just move everything from there to here. Like, no, it, no, it's a big problem. Huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so hopefully by February, I'll be able to breathe again. We'll see. I don't know, but that's, that's crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. Um, okay. Switching gears a little bit, but, um, what would you say is one of your proudest professional moments? Ooh, okay. It's, I, I had, a, I knew you were going to ask this question and I just couldn't think of something that really, did more for me than what I'm going to say. And you're going to go, oh, ho, hum, this is so trite. But I will tell you the truth. At the end of a project, when the client says, this has been amazing, we loved working with you and we want to work with you again, I can't tell you how that makes me feel. Because when I first started as a designer, I was a disaster. People did not say that to me at the end of the projects. People said like, bye. Bye. <laughs> right. And so we worked really hard to develop a linear process for running projects to be really good at project management. And for now, for clients to, I just had a client recently and I said, well, we're done. Can you believe we're done? And she, she looked at me and she's like, 
you're not leaving me, are you? You're never leaving me. I'm like, no, I, you know, anything, you, you know, I'm here kind of thing. So I just can't think of anything that rivals that. Um, and I've had some really good, you know, wonderful achievements. I did 265 episodes of my own TV show. That was pretty cool. That's a lot of episodes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just that moment. I mean, you know what I mean? When the client says, this is great. And I want to work with you again. That's the big thing. I, and I will hire you again. Yeah, that is cool. Especially on a thing like a house, like you're, again, you're not necessarily planning to do it again tomorrow <laughs> or next year or even three years yeah. away. Um, so that, that is really cool. Um, so I'm, I always ask our, our guests, if they have any design heroes and, you know, maybe you could even take this down the the broadcast path if, if that's appropriate, but just kind of curious if there's anybody that you kind of looked up to or, um, uh, admired as you were coming up in the biz. I, there are so many people. One of them, um, I remember I was in Italy. We were filming for, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't in Italy. We were in New York. We were filming for Design for Living. And uh, there is a designer, I don't even know if he's still alive, but a super talented man named John Saladino. And I was asking him um, about how do you deal with clients who say they can't afford your services or can't afford the item that you're proposing. And he was telling a story about how a woman came up to him at a dinner party and she said, I would do anything if I could afford you, but I can't. And he said, well, why don't you sell those diamond earrings? And then you can afford me. And I thought like, Oh my God, you are my hero. Like that is the truth. Um, so I would say he's definitely one. And then there are just, there's just so many designers I admire. Barbara Berry, she just burst onto the scene and was able to do something so original for so long and then became so copied. So everybody copied what she did, but she had this original thought. And I guess that's part of it, right? Anybody who brings an original thought to the table, I just admire and respect so much. And they have about 12 seconds to enjoy the fame of that original thought before it's knocked off at restoration hardware. Yeah, good point. Um, all right. So another question that we ask everybody who's been on the show, and this doesn't have to be a design answer, but you know, creatives on the whole, I think are we're an obsessive group. We find little obsessions and things we get nuts over for a little bit and then maybe on to the next thing, or some of us find a thing that we're obsessed with forever. What, what is it that you find that you're most obsessed with right now? Oh, right now, right at this minute, right at this minute. <laughs> what am I most obsessed with right at this minute? I, I have to get out in the world again. I feel like I'm going to lose my mind if I don't get to go to Bali and do that yoga retreat. So I am sort of obsessed with figuring out travel plans for 2022. I'm going this month. Is it November yet? No, it's yes, it's November. I'm going to see the polar bears in Manitoba, Canada, mm -hmm. Churchill, Manitoba. So, and the reason we did that is because I thought if COVID isn't over, where's some place that you could go and relatively free of people and probably pre pretty safe in the event that it's still like a raging pandemic. And so we said, let's go. How far North can you go in Canada? And what can you see? And so we're, and we're going to see the polar bears, but I am like really looking forward to like going, I haven't been to Paris in a while and I want to go to Greece with some girlfriends. Like mm. I just love travel. I find that that's how I recharge my battery, my creative battery. And then I come back to work and I'm a lovely person to be with again, but it's, it's been a while. I'm, I'm the same way, definitely with travel and itching to, to do more of it. Although I'm, I am really curious about the Venn diagram where travel and safety and polar bears all worked into the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My mind is a mess. Yeah, we're, we're talking about wild polar bears, right? Like not just. Yeah. In a zoo or in an exhibit. Yeah, we are not going to be going up and petting the polar bears. Apparently, we're like in these Hummer tank type vehicles. Okay. Um, but it's like, sounds like it's really, really cold. Um, and uh, anyway, 
I, you know, now, now when I tell people I'm going to see the polar bears, they're like, did you lose a bet? <laughs> oh, that'll be awesome. Oh, that's one of my favorite jokes too. <laughs> um, well, okay. So maybe, maybe there's a future where you're designing the interiors of these Hummer tank things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I'm, I'm curious if there's anything like on your future design, you know, a uh, bucket list. If there's anything that you really want to do or something that, um, you know, a dream project that's on your list. Well, now that, now that I've worked on the van and I'm working on an RV, I think I would really love to do a private jet or mm. a yacht. I think those are so like, it's such a fun project to imagine getting everything you need contained in this small space seems really exciting to me. Um, I love doing commercial projects. They're so different than residential, like just the level of hands off of the stakeholders is really enticing and exciting. Um, And um, just the ability to just be a little bit more creative, maybe not a different shag carpet color in every room, but (laughs) right. But a little bit, you can spread your wings a little bit more in terms of being creative on a commercial project than you can, I think sometimes on a residential project. Yeah. Interesting. What, what do you do with the project or how do you, you know, get out of the mindset when something doesn't go well, like how do you find your way back to, you know, a either positive attitude or kind of shake off that, that tough situation? Man, we had a really hard situation recently where we ordered a sink for clients. Of course, we waited, you know, nine months for it to arrive. And it was a, a sink that has a drain on the right side, not in the center. Most sinks have a drain in the center, no big deal. But this one is supposed to have a drain on the right side. But when we opened the box, it was a drain on the left side. Mm. And that seemed to like set off a series of unfortunate events that led to the client being unhappy. And we don't deal often with unhappy clients, but I think it was the stress of COVID and delay and they were just so annoyed that it was the wrong sink. It didn't matter that we ordered the right-handed drain. You know, our paperwork Mm. is very clear on that. They just sent the wrong one. And so, um, you know, it's so demoralizing and so depressing when you see a project going off the rocks. But one thing I know for sure is every single time it happens, the first thing I have to do is look back and see where I veered from my process that could have prevented it. And sometimes there's nowhere like the, the mm-hmm. scene, there was nothing we could have done. We, you know, but often there is a moment where you go, ah, uh, I'll just skip that step and we'll go straight to this. And then you're like, oh, what have I done? Right. So I found that being ultra responsible, trying, trying to accept responsibility for everything that goes wrong on every project allows me to get to solution and long-term fix faster. Is there anything that you watch out for or that you've found to be kind of like red flags for, you know, not necessarily a bad client, but just maybe not a great fit for you? Yeah. (laughs) How much time do we have? Uh, Yeah. You know, the client who wants to negotiate your contract, like non, not, not for negotiation. Sorry. No end Mm -hmm. of discussion. We're not having it because I just know that that's, if you're going to have a fight, that's the fight to have. Like nothing in my contract is negotiable. Um, And the reason that's important is because the client has never run an interior design firm. I have, I have. So I know what's Mm. required in the contract. You don't, you don't know what's required in the contract. So that would be a red flag. The, um, an unrealistic timeline is a red flag. Um, uh, hmm, what else? Oh, uh, we always ask how many other designers that they've worked with. And if, you know, it turns out that they work with three or four designers and those other three or four designers were all idiots. Mm, chances are mm. we we're going to be the fifth idiot. So we like, no, thank you. Um, yeah, those are, those are the big ones I would say. Yeah. Is it scarier that they've worked with four and you know, they're not saying kind things about them or is it scarier if they've never worked with a designer before? Such a good point. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, neither are ideal. Um, if they've worked with other designers, we always ask who it is. It's a small 
pretty small world. And so mm-hmm. they'll say somebody's name because they'll say, oh, I don't want to say, we'll say, no, we, we have to know. And occasionally I'll think like that person is an amazing designer. So if they weren't mm-hmm. happy with them, they're not going to be happy with me. Or I'll think, ah, okay, we've worked for other clients who had that person first and they were a disaster. So maybe it's not the client this time who's at fault. Maybe it is that person. I've also phoned up designers who and called them and said, what was Mrs. Smith like? Mm-hmm. You know, she's calling our office. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Okay, thank you very much. Or they'll say, we've worked with other designers and we'll say who? And they'll say, oh, a person at Restoration Hardware or a person at Ethan Allen. Okay, that's not it. That might be a designer, but really that's a store salesperson. That's not what mm-hmm. we do. Um, and then the person who's never worked with anybody. Yeah, you run the risk, don't you? That that um, you just have to be really careful you really have to manage our expectations at every step of the way. Yeah, definitely. Is, is there anything that you see kind of out in the market and you've alluded to a few things, but I'm curious if there's other things in the design space that just kind of like drive you nuts, either commonplace things or trends or, you know, other things that drive you crazy. So many things. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. I always say you should never hire a designer who doesn't have an opinion, but, um, like I'm, I'm really over a white kitchen with white Carrera Marva countertops. Now that we've done 107 of them, it's like, please don't ask us to do it again. Like it's too much. You remember the movie? Um, what was it called? As good as it gets? No, the other one, the one with Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson and it's set in the Hamptons. It wasn't as good as it gets. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, that kitchen was beautiful. And for like five years, everybody wanted that kitchen. So mm. we're like, again, 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 we're doing that kitchen. So, so just repetitiveness and redundancy and doing what the neighbors did. That's kind of exhausting. Um, I'd say um, pot lights that aren't in the ceiling in a logical position where you need light. Mm. That makes me crazy. Uh, Baseboards that are too short or too high for the ceiling height makes me crazy. Oh, anything on a corner. Oh my God. Corner tub, corner shower, corner cabinet. I can't, my eyes bleed. I can't even look at it. Um, there's so many, there's so many, you, are you sure you want to go there? Josh? Like, that's a whole podcast. This is what we should have started with. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So just to, we'll hit pause on the things that drive you crazy. Um, maybe switch over to the advice category. Is there anything, maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've received or a favorite piece of advice to share with your team? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not easy to do because a lot of people, a lot of creative people are people pleasers. I certainly count myself in that category, but saying no, as sometimes as a creative person is the only power you have. So I'm learning that no is a complete sentence. Mm. I am not required to justify it, explain it. Um, it, No is no. And I, you know, the more I explore that, the better I find it is for clients too. If the answer is no, I really do them a disservice when I say, well, I'm not sure. I don't think so, but maybe we could, but I probably can't. Like the answer is no. So yeah, no is a complete sentence. Practice, practice using it more. That's good. I love that. No is a complete sentence. Um, I'm curious if you have any encouragements or asks that you'd like to issue to our audience. Ooh, if, if the, if the question is um, to, to try to get you to challenge your thinking, I, this comes up a lot. Somebody I'll be coaching an interior design professional because through business of design, people hire me for coaching all the time. So I'll be, somebody will say, um, this client wants me to do the following thing. I don't really want to, but I didn't want to disappoint her. I didn't want to let her down. And I always think like, wow, but you're willing to let yourself down or let your husband down or let your kids down. Like saying yes to that thing you don't want to do means saying no to something wonderful you might want to do. And that's easy for me to say now. I'm super established in my career. If you're just starting out, of course, you're going to take every job that comes your way. We all did. There's no no shame there. But um, I think 
to, to, to just recognize that as a human being, you have as much value as your client does. And if it's, it needs to be a win-win, you, you both need to get something out of the relationship. This is not as a creative professional, we don't owe anybody our services. Not everyone can afford your services and there's no obligation to meet the needs of everyone. Um, and I think as people pleasers, that that's a really hard lesson for some of us. Well, speaking of business of design, who is that a great fit for? Give us kind of the the pitch for that. Well, business of design started organically because I, I mentioned when I first started as a designer, I was failing so miserably. I desperately wanted to make my clients happy and do good work, but I just kept disappointing them over and over and over again. Timelines, budgets, it was all a disaster. So I ended up hiring this business coach and she finally convinced me, we worked together a decade, that you need to be reliable like a bank. You, you, they need to know when they hire you that they're going to get from A to B in a, in a relative, um, you know, normal amount of time. And you've got to manage their expectations. And here's how we're going to do it. So at Business of Design, we teach the 15-step project management strategy uh, to interior design professionals, how to run the projects. You launch it. If you launch a project strong, you can end a project strong. But if you don't launch it right, it's over. And what we did is we just share the entire 15-step process. And in fact, in January, we are going to be at Las Vegas Market with three morning seminars where we will will um, teach the business of design 15 steps. And uh, yeah, we would love to have anybody who's running an interior design business or an um, architecture business or landscaping business. Uh, we'd love to meet you and work with you. Awesome. Well, before we let you go, let our listeners know where they can learn more about you and business of design and anywhere else you are on the interwebs. Awesome. Okay. So business of design is easy. Business of design.com. I'm easy too. Kimberly Selden.com is pretty easy. Um, and um, if you are in the mood to watch some decorating on TV, check out CityLine, cityline.ca. Uh, I do home day and uh, do home tours and things like that on that show on C um, City TV. Awesome. Well, Kimberly, it was great chatting with you and learning more about your design practice and all the things that you have going on. Nice to talk to you too. I'm curious to see if you're going to trick out that van now. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> <laughs> it's that whole sawing through the metal wall that has me a little intimidated. <laughs> mm, yeah, probably good, good caution there. Well, thanks for being on the show today. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Thank you, Josh. Okay, kids, that's episode 168 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.